Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fall reopening town hall. Thank you all very much for making time to attend this event. I'm Christopher Cyphers, the provost at SVA, um, and I will uh, identify the various members of the panel and they can introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Michael Severance. Hello, I'm Michael Severance. I'm the um, operations manager for academic affairs. Welcome. Uh, Jarvis. Oh, hello. My name is Dr. Jarvis Watson. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm your inaugural director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a pleasure. Vince, I'm sorry, I, I skipped you. Oh, it's okay. Uh, my name is Vincent Beerich. I'm the technical director at the SVA Theater. Ms. Rando. Hi, everyone. My name is Janine Rando, and I'm the director of the Office of Student Accounts. Bill? Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Martino. I'm the director of Student Affairs. Welcome. Kayori? Good afternoon. I'm Kaori Uchisaka, director of the International Student Office. And Yoko. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Yoko Anderson. I'm the assistant director in the International Student Office. Welcome, everyone. Emily? Hi, I'm Emily Ross. I'm the associate provost. Um, I will be uh, moderating your questions tonight. So uh, please remember to type any questions you have into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Jason? Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Koth, and I am the registrar at SBA. Stephanie? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Joshua, and I'm the associate director for the Office of Residence Life. Last but not least, Christine? Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Gilchrist. I'm a registered nurse and the associate director of Student Health and Counseling Services. Great. Thank you all. Do we have any questions? Not yet. Uh, then I will sing a song. Maybe that will prompt some uh, questions. Well, presumably, the 240 of you who are here join because you have questions you want answered. So please uh, uh, enter them in the Q&A um, box, and we're standing at the ready. Old McDonald okay. had a <laughs> the we, oh, there we go. See, I now. knew it. Once I started a tune, uh, we'd, we'd get some questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first question is for Bill. When will the orientation week schedule be uploaded? Uh, that is a great question. Um, I am actually going to send out a second uh, orientation email later this afternoon to all of our uh, first year undergrads and graduate students um, and where the email says uh, check on check with the orientation page uh, later in July and by later in July we will have uh, the full welcome week schedule. Thank you. Jason, question for you. When will we be getting our IDs? Uh, ID cards, uh, if you don't already have them, I would assume uh, you're a new incoming student uh, or a, a continuing student from uh, into the second year uh, since we were online last year. There is a, there is a uh, online form, it's through your My ID account where you can submit your photo for your ID card and uh, we will print it here in-house and then it will be available during orientation for pickup uh, on uh, the 28th and 29th of August for new students and coming for orientation or any time after that in our office. Uh, if any students need a reprint of their ID, uh, if you lost it or um, you know, it's not working or if it's a very old ID, you can certainly uh, submit a request there as well and we will reprint it in the same way and you can pick it up at our office. Uh, there, I, I will drop a, a link in the chat uh, to where that, uh, that form can be found. And the location of your office. Oh, and the location of our office, yes. At 205 East 23rd Street. 
Chris, Maybe I have some go. questions for you. Oh, goody. <laughs> Are there any discussions regarding eliminating the mask mandate for vaccinated individuals? Uh, not at the moment, no. Um, that may change as time goes on, but uh, the plan now, we are following WHO guidelines, um, uh, but masks will be required um, once uh, you all arrive on campus. Uh, the situation, and I'll let Stephanie speak to this, is slightly different uh, in the residence halls. Um, and then Christine, if, uh, if you have anything further to uh, comment on the, uh, the, the mask requirement. Stephanie, do you want to talk about the yes um, the mask requirements in the residence hall? Yes, and so um, if you are registered for housing, you've likely received at least two global communications uh, related to fall housing assignment uh, confirmations, which went out during the first week in June, and then two weeks later, fall uh, opening dates for check-in. Um, in those communications, we did indicate that we'll be making an announcement about COVID-related policy changes for the fall, uh, emailing that to all students by the end of July. However, in our residence live town hall and in other town halls, we have announced some uh, tentative updates as it relates to COVID policies. Uh, regarding masks, uh, as it was this semester, masks will be required likely uh, in all areas outside of your personal living space. That is what we had in place for the last academic year. And it's likely that we will continue with that unless the guidance changes significantly as we move into the late fall spring semester. Um, and other COVID policy uh, changes will be announced at end of June, including the uh, guest policy, um, as well as the 24th Street gym access, but it looks like we'll require masks in that space, but it will be open to students. But please look out um, in your email for that notification regarding COVID related policies for the residence halls for fall 2021. And did you I would re reiterate what um, Chris said about um, the WHO recommendations of the colleges following that this is part of our comprehensive plan to reduce the risk of COVID-19 on campus is requiring the vaccine, requiring masks and other um, assessments in order to keep the risk as low as possible on campus. And of course, uh, again, those, those guidelines or policies may change uh, once we get into the fall semester um, and you'll be the first to know. Chris, will there be any restrictions for where students can visit on campus, such as buildings, areas outside of their major? And what is open on campus now for student visits or use? Uh, well, the first part of the question is, yeah, you can move freely about the campus. Um, you'll need to swipe your ID card uh, when you enter each building. So if you're, uh, you're a returning student, uh, you were here in at least fall 2019, early 2020, you recall that you would just show it to the security officer. Uh, the Now you'll have to swipe the card that it's tied to a database that contains information about your vaccination status. Um, so as long as you've got your card, you'll be able to uh, swipe into uh, any building. The, the one exception might be the residence hall. If you're not a resident, um, you would be a guest and uh, I, as Stephanie noted um, by the end of this month the, the guest policy should be worked out in terms of access uh, this summer um, you depending on where I know the library is open during the week um, and certain academic buildings are open um, if you're coming from any distance I would contact the, your department to make sure that somebody's there. Uh, I'd, I'd hate for someone to drive in from Pennsylvania only to find that you know the door is locked and no one's staffing the building. But um, there are some classes going on this summer. Uh, we do have students. Um, we have a high school program. We have uh, graduate students. So um, as long as you've got an ID card, uh, you you can get in. Um, but in terms of the use of the facilities in, in our various buildings, uh, you probably would, wa uh, would want to contact the department to make sure that 
uh, someone say in the digital imaging center or the fine arts building is there to, to uh, receive you. Jason, I have a few questions for you. Sure. Since, since some of the classes went back to full capacity, will the course adjustment period be extended? Uh, the course adjustment period will not be extended, but we do have two opportunities. Uh, the first is in August for two days. Uh, I'll check those exact dates. And then for the full first week of classes, uh, which is September 7th through, I believe, the 13th, which is the following Monday. So that's the typical uh, course adjustment period time that we have. Uh, if classes are canceled, or um, there are any sort of major changes that occur between now and then, of course, your academic advisor will help you uh, get a full uh, schedule sort of squared away. But in terms of regular course adjustment periods, just the two before the, the semester begins and during the first week of the semester. And to clarify, will students be able to adjust classes themselves or does everything have to go through their academic advisor again for approval during the adjustment period? Yes, uh, there's an online form and we'll let you know exactly when that's up and, and available for use. But yes, you'll submit your, uh, your course adjustment requests via that electronic form that goes directly to your academic advisor. They will, um, if, if approved, they will adjust your schedule for you and let you know when it's all set. And those dates for the initial uh, course adjustment period are August 5th and 6th. That's a Thursday and Friday. And then the uh, larger course adjustment period begins September 7th and ends the 13th. One more. Sure. I'm a new student, but I don't remember which block I registered for. How can I find out? Uh, you can always check your schedule at any time on my services. My services is the sort of place where you go to register and things like that. And that's, uh, there's a link to it directly on your My ID dashboard. Uh, you can check your schedule, you can check uh, which courses are open and still have available seats there, and your block should be on there. If you have any other questions, though, you can always contact us at registrar at sva.edu, or you can uh, contact your academic advisor as well, and they can tell you exactly which block you're in. Thanks, Jason. Christine, for you. Will, will students be required to show proof of vaccination? What other new requirements that differ from pre-pandemic pre will there be? It's a good question. So yes, all uh, students, staff and faculty are required to uh, receive a COVID-19 vaccine. There is a secure upload portal, um, which will, is put in the chat right now. Thank you, Michael. Um, so there are a very limited number of obviously exceptions um, for, for folks that can't get the vaccine. So either your vaccine record or requesting an exemption is done through that link. So everyone should please do that as soon as possible. If you will not be vaccinated by August 1st, we ask that if you're not able to get access to the vaccine is why you're not able to, uh, to please fill out the exemption form. The other piece I mentioned a little bit earlier uh, will be rec you know, reporting symptoms, that sort of thing uh, through a system that the college is, has put in place um, for the past year, we've been using um, something that asks people before they come to campus questions about how they're feeling, um, some other risk things in order to decrease people who are sick coming to campus. I would ask everyone that's on this call, if you are feeling sick, please, you know, do, do the SDA community a favor. You should not be arriving to campus when you're not feeling well. So this is something that all of us share together, a responsibility to look out for one another, to be a community, uh, to keep support the health and safety of our community. So that's an example of um, some of the changes. So probably maybe take a few more minutes uh, just to click uh, some boxes. But again, this is being put in place for all of us, students, staff, and faculty alike. On that subject, we have another question about uh, what do you do if a classmate comes to school with COVID-like symptoms? I've been hearing people can still get COVID even after the vaccine. That's a really good question. So first is that part about, this is a commitment for all of us that we're looking at for one another. So really, we would hope that anyone, especially someone experiencing symptoms, would not come to SVA, but if they were completing that form, they would get a, a notification that they should not come to campus. Um, for how it works in New York City, if someone is uh, diagnosed with having COVID-19, there is a process to contact individuals that were in close contact with them. So, you know, it's not necessarily, oh, that someone was in the same room as you, but there's um, specific feet and time requirements to that. So. If 
um, the, the city health department in working with us found that you should be doing taking action, you would be contacted by the school. Uh, if I may um, just expand on, on, on Christine's response. Uh, as I said earlier, um, your ID card is tied to a database that contains your um, uh, immun not immunization, um, your vaccination record. So uh, swiping your ID card is something new um, that you don't need to provide. You don't need to present your, your uh, vaccination card. Uh, if you've uploaded it, as you should, it'll already be in the system. And um, uh, the point about, uh, you know, someone coming on campus with, who's uh, potentially uh, has COVID and we're not out of the woods yet, um, that's another reason why we are requiring masks um, is because the virus still exists and it's around and it can be introduced into our community in any number of ways. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's an added layer of protection for, for everybody, in, in, including all of you. Thanks. Christine, this is a, a tough one for you. My parents don't want me to get vaccinated, but I keep telling them I have to for school. Do I just get it anyway? I'm registered for housing, by the way. I really appreciate and agree, Emily. That is a tough question. Um, I certainly understand that there's a number of, of community members who might feel strongly against receiving the vaccine, or in this case, right, a family member and, and someone um, in your family is suggesting you not get the vaccine. It is a requirement of the college. Um, several hundred colleges now in the U.S. are requiring this. So um, while it is obviously a personal decision about being vaccinated, someone being a, a student in the SA community this year, it is tied to that. So um, I would encourage you um, to, to speak with them. Um, there's lots of different information available uh, about the vaccine. It's understandable that, that people have different concerns and frankly, I think their questions uh, should be answered. This is not the format really for me to go into all the vaccine stuff, but there's some really great work out there uh, through the New York City Department of Health, even on their Instagram, I would check that out. It has some commonly, um, commonly raised concerns and uh, answers from, from respected healthcare professionals. So I would suggest that as a starting off point. I wish you good luck because I know it's not easy um, to try to convince one's parents of anything, uh, but this is really important. This is a, a decision that the college does not make lightly, but it affects the well-being of all of our members. And um, so, yeah, I would, I would encourage you to revisit that conversation once you can maybe get some good information from them. Um, and I do encourage, yes, everyone to get vaccinated to reduce their risk of getting COVID-19. Thanks, Christine. One more question for you for now. Can I submit my COVID-19 vaccine documents post the August 1st deadline if my dose has been scheduled for a later date? Yeah, so that situation is actually uh, one where we would encourage people to request a temporary exemption. So if you look in the chat right now, um, so you could let us know, you know that you can't complete the requirement now, but you're in the process of receiving the vaccine. Um, and that would be all set. But we are looking to have this information, either a vaccine or you letting us know your status by August 1st. So we have a good idea of who will need some extra help when they come to New York City in order to get the vaccine. So please do upload either of those documents by the August 1st uh, requested deadline. But they can upload them whenever they get the, the, the final documents, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. So you could submit the temper exemption now, and then once you complete the dose, then we would ask you. So a uh, um, partial completion is, is not as interesting as we need it actually once it's complete. So that's a really good point, Chris. Now it would be a temper exemption. Once you receive the vaccine, you would just update us by submitting your document through that same upload link, um, uh, which is on the bottom of the chat right now. I'm, does that make the, I'm sorry, does that make the temporary uh, exemption, does, does that just go away if, if the, uh, the upload occurs by a certain date? Right, so we're just asking um, anyone to submit their, their form by August 1st, but yes, once we receive your temporary exemption, and you'll see by filling out a temporary exemption, there's certain requirements. Uh, that the college is asking you to sign off on. So once we receive your completed uh, vaccine, that would change that um, 
set of rules that comes for folks that are unvaccinated. There's a, there's a bit of human work that goes into it, so it's not an automatic process. But with your patients, yes, we will, we will get through these. Um, but please do, as soon as you are able to update your status, let us know. And through that same link, just upload your form or download your form, whichever direction that goes. Put your form in the, in the queue. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'm sorry. Stephanie, some questions for you now. Great. How many family members can come for move-in day? Great question. Uh, we added this as question Q and A uh, FAQ number six in the fall residence hall check-in dates notification that went out to all students registered for housing uh, during the last. I think it went out on June 29th. Um, so uh, each resident can bring up to three guests to assist with check-in. We also put some guidelines in there to prepare your guests to. Uh, have masks and be present with um, masks. Um, we will not uh, be able to have uh, residents sign in overnight guests uh, for the uh, process of assisting with check-in, but loved ones and family members can arrive uh, to assist with check-in um, and you can have up to three uh, loved ones or helpers. Uh, next question, if a student living on campus gets COVID, where would they have to quarantine? So uh, part of our uh, uh, COVID uh, policies and planning for the residence halls and for the college um, uh, allows for us to have quarantine spaces in the event that students do need to quarantine. So those spaces were set aside uh, last year uh, and they, ex they existed before, but we do have spaces set aside in the residence halls in the event that a student needs to quarantine. If I have secured housing for the fall semester off campus, would I be able to apply for housing for the spring semester? So yes, we e each year have residents, uh, whether they're coming into SBA as transfer students, so they're starting for the first time at SBA in the spring semester, or residents who are just coming into housing for the first time in the spring. Uh, residents can or students can uh, inquire about housing placement for the spring semester only. Uh, we generally begin to open that process during late November uh, for placement for the spring semester. So if that's something that a student is interested in, they can begin to uh, contact the Office of Residence Life about options after, uh, generally after Thanksgiving, so late November. And lastly, how can I contact the Residence Life Office personnel? They're not responding to my emails or phone call. So we are experiencing an extremely high volume of queries, especially coming off of our various town halls. Um, so we just ask that uh, resident students and parents be patient because this certainly is an unprecedented year for volume of queries and the queries are coming from a lot of different areas, not necessarily all residence life related, but we're trying to get to them as best as possible. We've needed to prioritize uh, responses to items. So I know that there are some queries that we generally get about roommate placements and they kind of have to be tempered in a different placement this year as it relates to us, our, us responding to COVID related items. So um, we ask for your patience and we will get back to all students. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move back to you for a second, Christine, because it seems like the bulk of the questions are vaccine related. What is the policy with religious exemption? Sure. So uh, I mentioned before that there are certain exemptions. So if you go to that same link uh, that Michael had put for exemptions, there's a form that would need to be completed to request an exemption. So all that information is posted on the upload site. Okay. Uh, will vaccinated and non-vaccinated students be required to do COVID testing periodically um, if vaccinated students can still get the virus and pass it on? That's a good question. So we're in the process now of working on what testing requirements will be in effect for the fall. Once that is established, we would let the students um, who are impacted that know what that is. But again, that's something that we're working on right now. Thank you. And uh, actually, I guess this is more of a question for Chris. I'm going to move over to you, Chris. What are the absence policies related to COVID? If I'm sick and not supposed to go to school, do I get an unexcused absence? Uh, we don't have un we don't have unexcused or excused absences. There are five absences, which is a rough, which is a third of the semester. Um, 
if you uh, have, an, have an illness that is going to result in a prolonged absence, I would suggest uh, um, requesting a medical leave of absence. Um, again, you've got five absences, whether you're sick, you go fishing, you travel, whatever the reason is. Um, after five, however, um, uh, you will be removed from your classes by the registrar's office. Um, you can always be reinstated, but um, there, there are no there are no excused absences, uh, whether it's COVID or um, a broken leg. I hope neither occurs for anyone. Um, but if, it, if, if you think you're going to be out for a month, um, then I would, I would consider a, um, a medical leave of absence. I don't know, Jason, do you want to expand on that a little bit? or correct? Yeah, if I can just qualify a few things. Uh, so the policy actually is one third of your sessions of a class. So some classes may not meet for the entire 15 weeks of the semester. A 15 week course, one third of that is five absences. But if a class only meets for half the semester, it's one third of those total number of sessions. So keep that in mind. It's not, a, it's not an across the board five for each class that you're in. Uh, but uh, to Chris's point, yes, there are really no excused absences, but you have an allowance there that you can use. Uh, if you are going to have, if you do run into a situation where you have a, uh, an illness or a prolonged something like that, uh, you really should, and especially if it's a pre-existing sort of situation, you should register with the Office of Disability Resources as well, because uh, attendance accommodations can be uh, made through them. But again, it's not something that can be retroactively uh, established. So if you have a, a, you know that something's going to affect your attendance for the entire semester, make sure that you declare that early, and you make sure that uh, disability resources is involved in that decision, and they can help you uh, with those sorts of things. Um, and I should mention too, yes, there are always extenuating circumstances. Uh, if for some reason you are withdrawn from a class due to absences, there is an appeals process that we go through. So. All is not lost, but we want to make sure that you're ahead of that and, and know what those are. And of course, 100%, we want you to stay home if you are sick. We don't want you to, um, to come onto campus, especially after the year that we've had, <laughs> to, to uh, put it yourself or anyone else get at risk. So uh, it is always, uh, there is an appeals process and it's always negotiable on those kinds of things. But uh, try to uh, keep on track of those things. And we do, um, we do let students know when you've hit a, a certain threshold of absences. So after two, three, or four absences, you will receive automated emails from our system that lets you know. So you'll be able to keep track of how many absences you're actually having. So um, and just keep those uh, points in mind as well. Michael, can you uh, put a reference in the chat uh, to the attendance policy in the student handbook or the SVA handbook? We're also receiving uh, a lot of questions asking whether uh, there is a possibility for a hybrid situation for students with COVID or to take classes online if they contracted COVID. Um, so if you just want to clarify that. I think that would be handled on a case by case basis. Um, most in person classes are, are not set up to um, run concurrently uh, with online students or have online students. So uh, if, you, if you do become ill, um, uh, we will work with you to, to somehow keep you up, up, to, uh, up to date in your, in your classes. Um, you know, we're not looking to punish anyone. Um, the attendance policy is driven by state regulations, which are quite strict in the state of New York. Um, depending on the class, um, your humanities and art history classes are already online. Um, but uh, if you become if you become ill with COVID or something else, God forbid, um, yeah, you we, we can work with you. Um, I mean, students get sick, they're absent for a period of time. Uh, and they usually work with their department chair and their uh, faculty members. Um, and everyone, you know, is is aware that this is a 
we're, as I said earlier, we're still not out of the woods. So, you know, uh, we, we, we're committed to being flexible and working with uh, students um, at, as needed to accommodate students with, uh, you know, situation like being infected with COVID. Will fully online classes be provided to seniors in the design major? Uh, it, it, it depends. Um, I, I think there are some thesis section, there, a thesis section, I'm gonna, Jason, I'm gonna hand this off yeah. because he probably knows better. Yeah, we're, we're working with um, a few departments uh, that have sort of larger interest. We, we have heard from a number of students through many different channels about uh, requesting an online uh, option. Uh, at the, beyond the second year, there are very few programs that have generated uh, interest, uh, a couple of those being the larger departments like design and illustration. So uh, the department chair and admins are looking at offerings right now. I hope that within a week, or so, we'll have some online uh, uh, options available at the upper level. Again, it's uh, it's it's going to be dependent and really uh, on on demand for those types of courses. So um, we will continue to keep uh, keep you posted on that. If you have not already sort of let us know that you're interested in in a completely online, um, we're talking completely online uh, schedule. Uh, not just one or two courses. Uh, make sure that you make contact with uh, the uh, your academic advisor is probably the best place. We're trying to keep a, a sort of master list of everybody who's requested that. That's really helping us to inform decisions on what courses we really need to offer and at what levels. So if that's something that you're considering but haven't made yourself known, uh, please make sure that you make contact with your advisor this week. Stephanie, some more questions for you. One, can we stand, stay on campus over break? Yes, the residence halls are open for winter and spring breaks at no additional fee or charge to students. Uh, the only exception is the summer uh, session, which is a, a different fee for those who elect to stay for summer. Uh, we do have students who remain in the residence halls uh, for winter and spring break, but many students do go home. It's completely optional. But yes, we are open for the breaks. And will residence life send an email on everything the dorms, sorry, residence halls come with and their dimensions? So uh, in the housing assignment confirmations that students have received so far, it does include a, an FAQ booklet about your individual residence hall where you are assigned. It includes a lot of information on the amenities, uh, what to bring, what not to bring, beds, bed size. Um, we may not have the detail of the dimension of every individual room because there's variation in each residence hall. So the, the degree of detail that um, you may want may not be included in the general information, but I would suggest that uh, students, residents read through the FAQ booklet and their housing assignment confirmation, all the other items that they received so that they can learn about their building and what they need to be prepared for arrival. I will be an orientation leader for the fall. When will I be able to move into the residence halls? So if you're an orientation leader assigned to housing, you likely receive that fall 2020 residence hall, 2021 residence hall check-in date. And it included a notification about uh, if you're a student leader that you will receive an update from your supervisor, whether you're an RA or an orientation leader about your move-in date. So orientation leaders will receive that update from the Student in Engagement and Leadership um, Office and resident assistant student leaders receive that from their supervisors within Residence Life. In the Residence Life Town Hall, it was said that move-in will be done in groups and each group of students will be given a move-in time. When will this schedule be available? Great question. So we're looking to send the actual move-in times uh, in an email for the uh, called Getting Ready for Check-In, which we send each year. Uh, that will go out during the last week in, in July. It will include information about parking, parking garages in the area of the residence hall, what to bring for check-in. You should review the information you've received thus far about guests and what you need to prepare for that. Um, but you will, look, you will, will be able to get the information about check-in uh, dates and windows of time 
uh, in the getting ready for check-in fall 2021 email, which will go out during the end of July. So just to clarify, can we have overnight guests? So uh, in the uh, notification that we have sent out, it does indicate that you cannot sign in overnight guests. Uh, the, help, the only guests that are permitted in for the check-in process are helpers and they cannot stay at during uh, for overnight. We will also be announcing the COVID policy changes for the residence halls for fall at the end of the month. But I've shared um, that what we expect it to be we expect for the guest policy uh, for fall to be a phased in process, meaning initially for safety purposes and until we have our documentation on everyone's vaccination status, um, there will likely be no guests, overnight guest sign in. We will then phase in likely within a couple of weeks uh, visitation between rooms within the existing building. Uh, following that, we would phase in visitation of students uh, from one residence hall to another SVA residence hall. But the final determination about overnight guests for external visitors and whether or not they need to demonstrate vaccination status, all of that needs to be reviewed and that will be outlined in the guest policy when it goes out um, at the end of the month. That's something that's going to be reviewed by the college overall and we wanna make the best decisions in line with what the public health guidance is uh, for our students for external guests. It's likely in the event that external guests are permitted in, which we're not sure yet, it will likely include some type of demonstration of vaccination status. One more question for you for now. Uh, if we are vaccinated and an international student, can we move in early? So what we have sent out so far, and um, if you're an international student assigned to housing now, you likely received a notification with a survey uh, asking about your plans for arrival for fall. We've currently indicated that uh, you should plan to arrive per the guidelines that are indicated in your confirmation uh, check-in date for fall. We are um, asking that students arrive at the date indicated. Um, we're, uh, there are some allowances for international students who may have limited access to the vaccine in their home country to arrive early uh, for the purposes of being vaccinated in, in New York or the US. And we're looking to limit that, but we will review uh, early move-in requests on a case-by-case -case basis. So where possible, we ask that students adhere to the date indicated, but if there is an extenuating circumstance, we will review that uh, when that request comes in to our office. Thank you. Okay, I think we're gonna move back to you, Christine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, hold on. So if I have symptoms and get a negative COVID test, can I come back to class as soon as I get the negative results? Okay, so as, as one of the nurses at SA, I'll just remind someone, if you're having symptoms, we ask that you stay home. So symptoms could be other stuff, right? You could have the flu, you could have a cold. We're, we're all in this together to reduce any illness on campus. So if someone's still having symptoms, yes, I would ask that they stay home, even if the test is negative. Um, given a situation like this, um, there are, certainly could be extenuating circumstances. This is something you can certainly consult with student health and counseling services. But I just want to be clear that if someone is sick and having symptoms, let's, you know, let's do our best to not come to work slash school if we're sick. There still is a flu season, lest we forget. Yeah, there's all that, all that other stuff. You could very well have influenza, um, which would right. not show up on a COVID test, of course. And um, we would, we would ask that if you're anyone, a member of our community is uh, is not feeling well and uh, is sick, um, stay home. Jason, I have a question for you. Uh, will updated fall 2021 stickers for IDs be given out and when? Uh, no, we won't need them anymore, actually, because uh, of the aforementioned by Chris uh, uh, implementation that we've put into place now. So your ID card actually will be tapped at the security desk. It will sort of give you a, a, a green light or a red light, basically. So it's checking that you're registered, that you're eligible to enter the building, that your vaccination status and all that stuff. So it's sort of rendered the ID sticker um, irrelevant now. So uh, that was its primary purpose. So uh, no need to stop by our office like you've done in past years. If you're registered and you still have your ID card, you should be set to go. 
some more questions for you, Jason. Can I sit in the class and get the permission from the teacher like I did in the past? Uh, unfortunately, no, we have stopped that sort of practice. Actually, it was never good practice. Everybody who's sitting in a class should be officially registered for it. And faculty are no longer allowed to over enroll classes. Uh, we have to, we are still taking uh, safety very seriously, uh, even though we've gone back up to 100% capacity um, or normal capacity in our classroom spaces. We don't want to overflow them, and there are other sort of safety precautions at play there as well. So you may only register for classes that have available seats in them, and you may only be registered by your academic advisor. So your, um, your department uh, and your instructors uh, cannot uh, uh, sign you into classes, and they should not be allowing you to sit in class either. And can a student who is starting in the fall defer until the spring? Uh, yes, uh, it, it depends on what program you are in. If you're a new student starting in one of our sort of undergraduate and general foundation classes or even in photography, we have uh, foundation blocks that are starting in the spring semester. So yes, you may defer. Uh, if you are thinking about deferring uh, your classes and you're in the second, third, fourth year of your undergraduate program, that uh, that is a good question, and it, it, the answer is that it, it, it depends. You know, we will try to accommodate everybody as much as we possibly can, but just note that some uh, programs are very rigorous and regimented in what classes, you know, uh, you have a year-long sequence in a lot of classes. You've got part one in the fall, part two in the spring. Uh, so it is harder to sort of come in in the spring when you're half through a class that uh, meets for an entire year. So uh, th that's not to say that it's, um, that it's impossible to do. Certainly, if there are enough students to warrant a section, we can always add a section of uh, you know, part one and then take part two in the, in the summer or something like that as well. So if you are thinking about that, please make sure that your academic advisor is aware uh, and they can look at your, your whole you know, schedule and your progress toward your degree and, and see what is most feasible for you based on what we have available for registration at this point. Is there a deadline for grade appeals for any given semester? Uh, grade appeals have to be filed within one year of the end date of the term in which the grade was given. So if you're um, appealing a grade from spring 2021, you have until the end of spring 2022 to appeal that grade. I have a tough one for you, Chris. Sorry. What if my religious beliefs go against the vaccine and I don't wish to involve my religious leader in the exemption process? Can I simply write my personal written statement? I don't believe we should have to justify our beliefs to this extent. Uh, well, I'm afraid um, that is part of the, the process. Um, uh, I mean, what's to stop anyone from saying, I, I don't want the vaccine because of religious reasons and, and, and um, not have to, uh, provide a justification for that. Um, those who are seeking a medical exemption have to provide um, documentation that supports that request. And uh, the same is true of the uh, religious exemption. Um, that's just the way it is, I'm afraid. Um, uh, on a related note, is there any sort of backup plan for 100% online classes in case the pandemic gets really bad again? And if so, could we request a gap semester or year? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm not betting the farm on anything, but um, I, uh, we have every intention of, of being open. There's no, the, the, um, the statistics in New York City for, uh, concerning rates of infection, hospitalization, uh, deaths continues to decline to almost a de minimis uh, level. Uh, really the same is true across all of New York State. Um, it's been uh, um, published that uh, at least two of the, of the vaccines, um, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, are effective against the, uh, the so-called Delta variant. Um, and if we are all wearing masks, um, then, you know, that's another 
added layer of protection. In the unlikely event that we have to pivot to an online uh, semester or year, and I sincerely hope that's not the case. I don't think any of us want to go through that again. Um, you, you, one could uh, certainly request uh, a gap semester or a gap year. Um, you can. You, there's nothing stopping anyone from taking a, a leave of absence. This question isn't really related to uh, our reopening, but uh, the questioner um, is persistent. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you, Chris. Um, what is the status of SVA's conversion plan uh, from for-profit to non-profit? Uh, that I don't know. Sorry. Okay. Well, I, I will say that the, the, the pandemic uh, delayed the planned conversion. Um, I know it's not completely off the table, um, but there are a lot of factors involved in, in getting that process back on track. Um, and I don't, I don't have any details other than, other than to say that uh, it's still under you know, active discussion. Here's a question for Dr. Watson Jarvis. I'm really glad this question was asked. What kinds of diversity and inclusion training will be made available for students, faculty, and staff? Well, that's a great question. And thank you for asking that question. Um, one thing we're gonna be starting off with is um, uh, putting a series together. And the first series, uh, first part of that series, we'll be looking at microaggressions and, um, and bias. Um, but there's another way we actually call what we call microaggressions, subtle acts of, in, of exclusion. So we kind of go a little bit more in depth about what that definition is. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is um, hopefully working with uh, Kiori's area to talk about language and um, name pronunciation. Um, the other thing we want to look into a little bit more in depth is our power and privilege. Um, we also will be working with some different um, working groups that to look at the curriculum um, to revisit the curriculum and see how we can make that a little bit more um, inclusive. Um, we also want to talk about pronouns, um, gender and sexuality. I'm trying to think of one of my other thing that was um, on the docket, but all, I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about a lot, and I think we definitely want to bring more light to this, is our students learning with, disab with disabilities. Uh, we need to be able to make sure we have more information about that, but also helping um, faculty to add these things onto their syllabi um, and not just to put it as a um, a bullet point, but also to be able to talk to talk about it in depth to help students understand these are resources that are here for you. And the wonderful thing is we work with everyone, um, at least my office, uh, working with everyone throughout the campus to make sure that, you know, we refer and uh, get students to the proper places. But I can also, I'm not sure if I have my um, email. Um, I think, Michael, if you want to share that, if you want to put that in there, if you have any additional questions about that, please feel free to email me at uh, diversity at sva.edu. But a great question. Do you want to mention the bystander training? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, bystander training is also coming up um, in a couple of days. I know that is Christine Gilchrist, uh, who and Laurel Christie and Kiari, who have been leading the pack on that. And I'm re really glad to see it come here on campus. Um, so hopefully that'll be, uh, that may be in the chat as well. So please check for that um, uh, update as well. So yeah. Uh, Kiari, Christine, or, or what, Jarvis, maybe you want to explain what, what bystander training is. So it's actually the bystander intervention to stop anti-Asian American uh, harassment and xenophobic harassment. So it's it's a, a training just for the SFA community members, students, faculty, and staff. And it's this Thursday at 3 p.m. It'll be held online. And it's given by an organization called Hollaback, uh, introduced by Christine. Um, and they give practical tips, five things you can do to protect yourself and um, intervene when you witness somebody else being harassed or if, if it can't be for you. Um, but it's a very useful training. And it's one of the things we put together in response to the uh, anti-Asian uh, harassment and hate crimes that we've seen in the past year. So we look forward to seeing you there. Yeah. Oh, Will that be offered again at another point uh, during the academic year? Uh, a follow-up training for general street harassment will be offered, I believe, during orientation. Oh, great. Thank you. 
Oh, I guess uh, if there's additional information that you'd like to find out about what's happening um, as far as DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion, um, Michael, you can also put in the, um, the website that has um, also a blog page that you can um, follow up with. Um, actually, tomorrow I'm actually doing some recording with um, a few students um, to kind of get their lived experiences about being students on campus. And we've done a number of uh, uh, blog entries about, you know, just things that have been happening across campus, but also across the nation. So please uh, feel free to find a little bit more information through that resource, which will also be in the chat as well. So thank you for asking that, those questions. Okay, we um, are getting close to the one hour mark. I'm going to try to get through uh, as many questions as I can. I have a few more for you, Jason. I think they're quick ones. When will we get our spring 2021 transcripts? Spring 21 transcripts. Uh, we don't send out transcripts after grades are in, but you can check your grades at any time on your My Services account. Do I need to get a new ID card or is the one I had pre-pandemic okay to use? If you had have an ID card that you were using uh, pre-pandemic, that should still be active uh, and completely fine to use. And this is a great question. I'm so glad someone brought this up. Is there a way to change the gender identity registered with the school and control what is shown to families? I have a transphobic family, but would like to be comfortable at school. Yes, absolutely. And Jarvis, you can jump in at any point too, but I can say that you may, uh, you may declare uh, in a couple of different ways. So in your My Services profile, uh, I'll put a link in the chat as soon as I'm done talking, you can declare your chosen name and you can declare your pronouns and your um, gender expression or identity. Uh, those are all options that are available to you. You can change them at any time. Uh, a, your chosen name will display on uh, rosters, student rosters, you know, uh, that your faculty may see uh, and uh, are available to all of us as administrators as well in our system when we interact with you. Um, your, your gender identity or expression is not something that is, uh, that is sort of publicly available to anyone other than you. You know, it's just a place for you to declare in case, um, it, you know, it's not like your faculty will see that or anything. They will see your pronouns and they will see your chosen name though, and that displays everywhere. Uh, again, that's not something either that would show up on any official documentation that we would send home to families like your uh, billing statements, your financial aid documentation, that would all always read your, uh, your legal name in a situation like that. But uh, on campus systems and rosters and things for uh, interacting with your faculty in the classroom, that will all read your preferences from there. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I don't think I could really say anything different or add on just to say that, you know, um, your professors should be able to go into that particular um, resource and, and see your preferred name. Um, so that will be protected. So uh, great question. And thank you, Jason. Yeah. Uh, a couple easier questions for Jason. <laughs> Uh, the original class schedule sent had a number of classes whose location was either TBD hybrid or online. Now that we're coming back fully in person, will new schedules be sent out? Uh, we generally don't send out schedules either anymore by paper or anything like that. Your schedule is always available on my services and it will always show the most up-to-date uh, information in terms of class location faculty, uh, all that sort of stuff. So I would encourage you and I will drop a, another link in the chat to my services to your direct schedule. So you can always check your schedule there. Uh, I will say, you know, there, there have been uh, modality changes and things like that. We will, we always will try to inform you if there's a change to a time, day, uh, faculty or location of your class, we'll send out an automated email from our system. So you'll, you'll get an email to your, uh, to your SBA account in a situation like that. But uh, you can always check at any time. And again, we there's I know that there's been a lot of going back and forth, a lot of uh, changes that have occurred in the last uh, couple of months. So uh, it's always a good idea to check your schedule on a regular basis. But again, we're trying to keep you informed of those changes as they occur. And when will we hear about term honors for spring 21? Oh, you got me called out. It's on my it's on my list of things. It's on my reminders of all the things to do. I'm, I'm going to get to it this week. So you should be hearing from us very soon. 
On that note, I'm going to hand it back over to Chris. Uh, I apologize if I didn't get to everyone's questions. Uh, I think all of the various offices have been <clears throat> listed in the chat at this point. So uh, I um, encourage you to contact any of those offices directly if your question hasn't been answered. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, Chris. <laughs> uh, uh, first, uh, my thanks to uh, my colleagues uh, who are on this panel. This is the second town hall. We did one last night at 9 p.m., large, largely for the benefit of students in uh, faraway time zones. Uh, that town hall uh, meeting was recorded, as is this one, and both recordings will be available on the SVA reopening page. So you're, you can come back to this and, and uh, refer to the some of the questions that were asked all the questions I thought were, were excellent and um, I'm sure we could have gone on for another hour or so uh, we will uh, we the royal we the, the school will um, be uh, continue to communicate with you all on a regular basis throughout the summer regarding housing registration Certainly, students, uh, international students, matters concerning uh, uh, immigration, ISO related uh, matters, orientation. So, uh, when you get an email from uh, from one of us at SVA, and I know we send out a lot of email to students, um, but I think for the next uh, six or so weeks until the start of the semester, it's important that you that you check your email um, regularly because uh, these updates that this is how we're communicating with uh, with the student body. Um, so enjoy the rest of the summer. Um, I, I, I can't express enough how uh, how anxious and eager we are to welcome everyone back to campus and um, return to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, if you don't live in New York City, uh, I can tell you that uh, it's the place is bustling. Uh, the traffic is back. The trains are packed. Um, it's uh, it's slowly getting back to uh, to to normal, the vibrancy of New York, which is the reason um, we all chose to be at SVA, either uh, as a as a faculty, staff, or more important, a student. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you back in, f in seven or so weeks, and. Uh, don't hesitate to contact any of the offices represented here today. Their emails are in the chat. And um, there are some good FAQ uh, items in the reopening page, on the residence life page. So um, definitely check them out. And if you are, um, hello, Martha. Uh, if you are uh, an international student, who uh, signed up for the international, the ISO uh, webinar, you should stay on this uh, call. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so I will uh, say farewell, uh, be well, and, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.